Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 532. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Jeff Walton, and it's September 11th, 2019. Okay, before we get too far into the episode, I need you guys to be participants of what's happening here. And you can do that by clicking the like button, which is always represented by a thumbs up. It's kind of a Fonzie thing. So you click the like button, whether you're on YouTube or on Facebook. If you're not subscribed to an episode, please subscribe. If you would like to add to the conversation, and I hope you do because we're going to talk a little bit about 9-11, uh, you can go to the comments on YouTube and fill out your comments. And we follow those as uh, broadcasters. We like to see what people are saying. I have Jeff Walton from the IRD. Uh, he's not a frequent uh, visitor to our program, so I thought we'd introduce people to IRD. What is it? Uh, IRD is the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Uh-huh. We're a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, and we consider ourselves an ecumenical alliance of U.S. Christians uh, working to call their churches back to historical, biblical Christian teachings and advocate for religious freedom at home and abroad. I direct our small Anglican program here. Hopefully a big Anglican program one day. Yeah. Uh, let's talk, I mean, you're from D.C. You're, well, you're from Colorado, but you live in D.C. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, today is September, September 11th. Uh, where were you? Yeah, I was um, on Capitol Hill on September 11th, 2001. Uh, I worked at that time in the uh, Rayburn uh, House Office Building, which is one of the three House of Representatives office buildings on Capitol Hill. And uh, I was a young intern uh, working for Congressman Joel Hefley from Colorado Springs at the time. He's long since retired. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I remember we had a south facing window uh, in our office uh, so we could see smoke from the the Pentagon. Um, The main thing I remember about that morning was uh, we had uh, televisions in the office and uh, we're watching uh, CNN coverage uh, of the uh, World Trade Center. And um, I actually wasn't really sure what to do at that point. So I had been working on some simple intern database responsibilities. And after watching the the first impact for a few minutes, I actually went back to work. Um, It wasn't until the second impact uh, took place that I actually stopped working um, because um, I wasn't really sure uh, what to do. And uh, we uh, evacuated um, within about an hour and a half um and uh all went home uh because it was uh an issue of safety concern uh the capitol police came through each of the office buildings and made sure we were sent on our way um i was actually in the uh metro center station which is the main junction of dc's metro system uh when the second tower collapsed and um the uh attack on the pentagon had a significant impact on the metro system because uh the blue line uh, which goes south from Washington, D.C. into Virginia, has a station that's directly underneath that's the right. Pentagon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Uh, I was uh, dropping the kids off at uh, daycare. I was a teacher at the time, and I remember the first reports on the radio, a small plane has hit World Trade Center. And I'm like, oh, man, how could you miss the towers? They're huge. And uh, so I thought a small plane had gone into him. Uh, six or seven minutes later, they updated the radio broadcast and said no, an airliner had gone into it. And, uh, you know, a little while later, a second one, and then the Pentagon. And, you know, it, it changed the course of uh, America forever. And uh, I hope it's a day we never forget. And I hope uh, every September 11th we share our stories of where we were and uh, what we remember. And I think that's uh, important. Uh, to keep this memory alive uh, for the sake of those who died and for the sake of the freedom we we strive so hard and fight uh, so hard for. Um, I have you on the program to talk numbers. Not that you're an accountant, but you are a reporter who, uh, when you see numbers come from places like the Episcopal Church or other denominations, you go through them to see, hey, is the church growing? Is the church shrinking? And then you try and figure out why. And uh, that's why it's a joy to have you in the program. Uh, the Episcopal Church put out their numbers, and from what I see, and I'm not trying to put a good face on that, but they're struggling. It, it doesn't look good. Uh, tell me uh, what you see. 
Yeah, uh, first a little context for viewers. Um, the Episcopal Church, along with the other six uh, denominations that are part of the mainline Protestant Christianity in the United so States. So we get Methodist, Lutheran, the United <clears throat> mm -hmm. Church, of, or Church of Christ. Um, mm -hmm. Who am I missing? Yeah, disci Disciples of Christ, uh -huh. uh, the Episcopal Church, American Baptist Churches USA, and... Um, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on one of them, but I'll remember it shortly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but but these are these are called mainline Protestant because uh, these churches and their predecessor bodies uh, were all uh, present in some way, shape, or form uh, at the founding of the United States. Um, so some of them go back quite a bit earlier than that. The oh, United Church of Christ is the other one, that's right, okay. which is the uh, descendant of the Congregationalist tradition and uh, the German Evangelical Reformed Church, which merged back in the 1950s. Um, these. Uh, the, the, these churches have been around for a long time and were the primary expression of Protestant Christianity in this country for most of its history, uh, although that changed pretty rapidly in the mid to late 20th century. Um, but uh, all of those churches have been in some stage of decline uh, for the past two generations, um, primarily since the uh, mid 1960s, and the Episcopal Church is consistent with that. Um, now, to speak to the Episcopal Church specifically, it has been in an uneven state of decline over that time period. Um, it, it has been in decline since the mid-1960s. However, there were points at which it was not in significant decline. Well, uh, in the, uh, if not the 1990s, they were not in a huge decline. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the 1990s, the Episcopal Church only lost a net 18,000 members. Um, now, part of that had to do with, uh, I would argue, the charismatic uh, renewal movement had had a positive effect on the church. Uh, there was Miracle also and Darian spill types of, yeah, yeah. There, there was also spillover from the Jesus movement in the 1970s, which yeah. had, in some way, shape, or form, brought people into the Episcopal Church. And um, the, the, there were certainly parts of the church that were in very steep decline in the 1990s, but there were parts of it that were growing. And um, that largely changed in the early 2000s. Uh, timed alongside with the consecration of Gene Robinson, although that's not the only reason, and it would be irresponsible to imply that it was. Uh, but it was one factor that um, basically involved uh, these uh, a significant shift into an onward, excuse me, a ongoing sustained rate of decline. Mm -hmm. So since the early 2000s, the Episcopal Church has been in consistent decline. Um, now, usually, that has been around 2% a year. Uh, that's significant, but it's not the end of the world. Um, this year, uh, the attendance rates at the Episcopal Church increased their rate of decline to 4.2%. Um, that's a very significant drop. Um, they shed about 36,000 uh, from the, uh, the rolls. And um, that's noteworthy. Uh, because um, two things. One is um, the rate of decline is not consistent, but it is accelerating. And the second reason is um, there had been buzz uh, among many people within the Episcopal Church that in 2018 there would be an attendance bump. Uh, there would be a temporary pause in the decline, and we'd actually see more people in Episcopal pews that year. The, the Michael and Curry effect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was Michael Curry was given an incredible platform uh, and he preached uh, to uh, significant acclaim uh, at the, the homily at the royal wedding, mm -hmm. uh, which billions of people saw. I think it was two billion people watched. Um, so that was people said, "Wow, this is going to be a a significant thing because people heard his homily, they praised it, and uh, it led to some significant things for Curry. He got a book deal out of it. He uh, went on the View." Uh, there were a few other shows that were um, not quite as prominent, but also had him on to speak. And he was even parodied on Saturday Night Live during Weekend Update. Uh, so that's significant. The culture that's when you know you made it. Before. When, when, when yeah. NSL takes you on, you've made it, you know. Yeah, and, and there was a, uh, some of the churches in my area were quite excited about it. There is an Episcopal parish uh, not too far from me that put out a big banner that had a Michael Curry quote on it and was clearly trying to celebrate the, this moment and make people aware that this is one of Michael Curry's churches. Please come and check us out. So there was a lot of optimism about that. We now have statistics from that year 
and we know that there was in fact not a membership bump and in, in fact there was a huge decline that year so um michael curry's message uh which was basically the beatles all you need is love um was very nicely received by people but did not cause people to to visit in any significant number and um as a result uh, the Episcopal Church is, is continuing its, uh, its, its decline, and it's uh, dropped below 1.7 million members in membership, and its attendance numbers are uh, down to about, um, about uh, o o just over half a million. Hey, that's, so, um, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, the Episcopal Church is still a, a large denomination. It is still relevant. Uh, but uh, it, it shed a, a tremendous number of, of people. If you go back just to 2003, the, the, the sheer number of people who have been lost it, uh, or just disappeared from the pews is it, it, it's, it's well over one quarter. Um, so uh, this is something that's significant. Also, just for a moment, stepping back and looking at other mainline Protestant denominations, which are the peer group that the Episcopal Church basically compares itself to. Um, most of them, uh, the Episcopal Church has been doing better than for the last 10 years. Um, the, the worst by far is the Presbyterian Church USA, which has been an absolute collapse. And um, the Disciples of Christ have been really, really struggling as well. They've been seeing the two of those between 6 and 7% decline rates, which is catastrophic. So a 2% decline rate in the Episcopal Church seems mild by comparison. Uh, but uh, this year, jumping up to 4.2% means that some of those same issues are there. Um, I would argue that the Episcopal Church has an important advantage that those other two denominations don't have. Um, money? It, uh, it does have a lot of money, <laughs> but that's not the advantage I'm thinking of. Okay. Uh, it, uh, the Episcopal Church uh, has something that those denominations don't have, which is a stream of people coming into it. Uh, no one is joining the PCUSA in large numbers. No one is joining the Disciples of Christ. But the Episcopal Church does have a stream of primarily liberal Roman Catholics who are looking for the traditions and things that they like in Roman Catholicism, but uh, wish to distance themselves from the moral teachings and architecture that's outlined by the They Roman want Catholic the smells Church. and the bells, but they don't want the, mm -hmm. the history that came with uh, some of the more recent Roman Catholic uh, scandals. Mm -hmm. I also want to talk mm -hmm. about demographics. I mean, mm -hmm. all churches are losing because there's just not enough replacement. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Volvol intellectuals aren't having kids mm -hmm. like they used to. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned in pre-show, well, the Mormons are having plenty of kids. Well, they, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. of course they are. Uh, they, have a, they have a different uh, uh, lifestyle, so to speak. And so that's mm -hmm. why all denominations are bad. But here we in the Northeast, we have some reformed synagogues that are being just decimated, closing doors left and right, because the average age of the people in the, in the pews are 75, 76, 77, and they're five years from just being, you know, completely closing the doors. Well, one thing I'd like to add, Kevin, is that when I say these churches are in decline, I'm referring to those in the mainline Protestant tradition. Sure. Not all churches are in decline. And in fact, there's several I can rattle off right now that have been in consistent uh, phases of growth. The Assemblies of God, the Church of God in Christ, which are both kind of costal. Um, the Presbyterian Church in America, which is modestly growing, but has been growing consistently the last seven years. Mm -hmm. um, the Wesleyan Church is also growing. Um, so these are examples of thriving Christian religion. Um, and obviously, ACNA has uh, been posting growth as well. It's modest growth, but it is mm. growing. And anything in the it, anything that's growing is better than something that's shrinking. Anything without the negative in front of it is good news. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But there's a uh, but but in, in addressing uh, what you've mentioned about reform Judaism in this country, uh, that is culturally tied to mainline Protestant Christianity in many ways, mm -hmm. um, that the way that their congregations and religious expression is is organized has intentional similarities, and um, some of the consequences that we've seen have been the same. Um, interestingly, Orthodox Judaism is thriving in this country, and Orthodox families welcome a significant number of children, uh, which is in all honesty, the main driver of religious growth. Uh, I mean, we talk a lot about evangelism, and evangelism is important, 
but the primary driver is and has always been procreation. Um, a lot of people think of the Amish as sort of a, a quaint uh, religious movement. Uh, but uh, I got to tell you, Kevin, the Amish are one of the fastest growing religious groups in the United States. Uh, the average Amish family has five children. And uh, as you might know, there's a period of time in which Amish children can go off into the wider culture and experience it. Absolutely. And then they can make a decision uh, to stay in the wider culture or to return. And uh, on average, uh, four of those five children in the average Amish family return to the Amish community. Um, and what we used to think of as a small uh, Anabaptist sect in uh, rural Pennsylvania and Ohio and perhaps Indiana has now spread to 18 different states in the country. Um, so there are thriving religious movements. Um, one of the things that they all have in common is they offer something that the broader culture does not. They basically, to be succinct, stand in contrast. They're a culture called counterculture, absolutely. Mm, yeah, which and, is uh, that, what the church Orthodox. was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, we see that with Orthodox Judaism. We sure. see it with uh, certain parts of evangelical and Pentecostal Christianity, and um, we also see it um, in, in, in groups like like the Amish. They're offering something that the culture doesn't provide. Um, Reform Jews are struggling because um, they uh, don't differentiate themselves from the wider culture. Um, they, for the most part, don't follow practices like keeping kosher. And uh, their children, uh, when they have them, uh, tend to marry non-Jews and uh, don't continue the same participation level at a synagogue, even if they still continue to identify as Jewish. Um, so that's something that we can see that actually has a lot of commonality with the Episcopal Church. Um, Episcopalians are not having as many children as they once did. Um, they are not seeking to evangelize in the ways that they were as recently as the 1990s. Uh, and uh, that sort of universalist thing that everybody go along to get along um, is probably the chief factor that kills churches. Uh, religious communities grow when they say, hey, we have something unique here that we don't believe is on offer anywhere else and we want to share that with people i think that's important because as you mentioned for the episcopal church beatles is their gospel uh the force from star wars is their god um they, they have trouble because that's not counter counter cultural that is cultural there's just you're not getting anything different when you go and sit in the pews except for some happy clappy and some bells and smells yeah uh, some of my friends have articulated to me and they've said why would i go to a church that's effectively the United Way, doing good, laudable things, but with a religious veneer, if I can simply go to the United Way and participate there, um, why would I get up to be part of a church community in the morning when I can go to yoga and brunch and also fellowship with people? Um, so obviously, uh, Kevin, where you and I are coming from as uh, traditionalist Anglicans, uh, we think that there's something unique about Jesus Christ that is not offered in completeness in any other religious tradition. And we want people to have that uh, knowledge of Jesus Christ and uh, an encounter with the Holy Spirit as a person, not as a thing. And uh, we believe that that's had an impact upon our lives. It, it, it's, it's changed us. And we want other people to experience that change too, because we think it's something good that we want to, to share. And as a result, we're willing to put out the social credit to take the risk to invite people to church, to share with them that there's something in our own private conversations with them that uh, we've experienced. Um, and that's something that the Episcopal Church seems to have lost. It, it still has some awareness of a, an attractional model in which they're like, well, we'll put out signs welcoming people and some indicators that we are involved in, in the community. And I think most Episcopal churches really are trying to do that. But what they, they don't understand is that it's not just welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we are being welcomed to something specifically, and we're being welcomed for something. Well, here in Connecticut, uh, every Episcopal church within driving distance here has a rainbow banner that says affirming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm in a kind of community here of 55 plus people, and they don't want that. That that's not what they're looking for. If the place they're going to changes over to that, they would still go because it's their family church. But uh, they certainly uh, um, 
have not, their idea of culture has not changed. And um, it, it's interesting to watch. It's not just that they want people to come in. It's they want people to buy the Beatles gospel. And uh, the people aren't yeah. ready for that. Well, there's also a sense that I argue that display of the rainbow flag is not first and foremost a sign of welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, it is primarily a signaling of virtue. Yes. Um, it is not people that are, if you talk to Christians that are actually going to spend time with um, the gay community, um, they, they often aren't the ones that are putting up the rainbow flag. I mean, it's one thing to go and, and march in a pride parade. It's another thing to, to go and spend time with the community and try to address its hurts. And uh, that's something that um, many Episcopal congregations are, are just not prepared to do at this moment in time. They haven't been, this may sound like a trope, but they haven't really been activated for mission. Mm -hmm. um, they've said, we've got a really nice club here and we'd like you to come and join that club. But that's not really the same as, 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 as an outward looking focus. Um, so one of my friends, uh, Jenny Noyes at New Wineskins, uh, which, by the way, Plug is coming up. Uh, is that coming up? Well, it is. Yeah. Uh, I'll be there in two weeks. Uh, I will too. It'll be great. Yeah. Um, uh, Jenny uh, spends a lot of time going to different church congregations within Anglicanism and talking about the importance of global mission. She is not detracting from the importance of local mission. Mm -hmm. But what she says, and I think she's totally right about this, is that if you have a mindset in your church that is globally focused, it will positively affect your local reach as well. Um, your, your people who go out on mission trips uh, or who send missionaries um, will be changed in such a way that they will also have conversations with their friends and neighbors and colleagues in a way that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and uh, this is something that I think the Episcopal Church is, is currently struggling with and in some places is missing is this uh, th th this this focus that is is outward based and says that the church is a hospital and jesus is a physician and if we're candid that in our hearts we're all burning dumpster fires uh but we're aware of that and we're asking the physician and we're asking our friends to direct us to the hospital so we can get healing and um this is something that when I say it, I, I think a lot of people, their eyes probably just roll over because they, they've heard it so many times since probably the 1970s, that sort of language. Uh, and there may be other ways in the future that that same message can be expressed differently. But um, there is something that is unique about Jesus and a church that doesn't have a sense of confidence in Jesus's uniqueness is not going to take the social risks uh, to go out and, and, and change the culture around it. Um, one thing I'd, I'd like to address, too, is kind of looking at some of these numbers. Um, they're organized by diocese. And uh, we are not really given as much detail on, on the lower level. Uh, but within every diocese, there are some places that are doing better than others. Um, for example, uh, George Conger's church, um, which is in Lakanto, Florida, um, it is uh, doing very well. Um, they have... Um, well, they've more than doubled in the last 10 oh, years. Hold on a second. Yeah. He wasn't just talking the talk. No. Uh, I <laughs> he wasn't data. just braggadocious. Yeah, I have data <laughs> from the Episcopal Church uh, that actually shows that uh, George was uh, was not selling us a false bill of goods. Um, there is something happening in his congregation, and uh, it is significant. And it's not just numeric. Uh, but but numbers are one objective form of criteria that we can we can look at to see sure. that. Um, so uh, his church is, is doing quite well, but there are other churches in Central Florida, which is a conservative diocese, which are not doing as well. And uh, Central Florida had a decline rate of about three and a half percent last year. And that's better than the Episcopal Church nationally, but it's not great. And uh, similarly in Washington, D.C., which had a similar rate of decline in the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, um, we also saw some churches that absolutely tanked, but the National Cathedral is actually doing pretty good. Uh, they got a new dean in 2016, who, from what I can tell, is a significant improvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the National Cathedral is is doing better than it was. So, um, well, uh, well, as long as you got the numbers right there, uh, yeah. which diocese did the worst and which did the best? Um, 
Well, it depends how you describe the worst. Uh, but uh, every diocese in the Episcopal Church domestically outside of the state of Texas or Navajo missions was in decline um, in some way, shape or form. Now, some of that decline is very modest. Um, the Diocese of Springfield, which is in Illinois, and the Diocese of Florida, which is northern Florida, uh, posted a 0.8 and 0.7 percent decline rates, which is very That's modest right. rate yeah. of decline. Uh, the absolute worst diocese was, um, as far as attendance, was the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire, which dropped 19.9 percent. There's a famous a guy. Where's that? What's that famous guy? Gene mm -hmm. something from New Hampshire. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Uh, Gene Robinson uh, obviously is no longer the bishop there, and he's been retired for several years. But uh, that diocese was hit really hard uh, during his tenure and following his tenure. And um, there are a few different reasons for this, but um, obviously New Hampshire is very rocky soil. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the, the fact is that was the worst declining di diocese in the Episcopal Church in 2018. Um, interestingly, I also looked around at some other dioceses. I was curious how dioceses that were previously traditionalist, but are now under progressive leadership had done. And the answer is very poorly. Um, the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Indiana, which was previously led by Bishop Ed Little, who was a, an outspoken traditionalist in the uh, House of Bishops, mm -hmm. um, uh, they have been under progressive leadership now for three years, and mm -hmm. um, they are tanking. Um, this is the diocese where, um, I always mispronounce his name, uh, presidential candidate uh, Pete uh, Buttigieg, is that correct? Something like that. Yeah. I always I always read it and I get the name wrong. Yeah, um, nice. But um, so he uh, he was married to his um, same sex spouse in the uh, cathedral in uh, uh, um, South Bend, Indiana, and um, uh, that diocese uh, has completely tanked. They they dropped almost ten percent last year alone. Um, so that's that's a real danger sign. Um, additionally, I was also curious about what the Episcopal Church refers to as the renewing diocese. Uh, these are dioceses that were basically restarts after the majority of their uh, people departed uh, for ACNA. Um, so this would include um, San Joaquin, uh, Tech Pittsburgh, uh, the Episcopal Church in South Carolina, and um, uh, Fort Worth. And um, of, of these, two of them are doing extremely poorly. Uh, Fort Worth is Episcopal, uh, the, the, the Episcopal Church's Fort Worth Diocese is doing very uh, poorly. And uh, San Joaquin is also doing very poorly. Yeah, these dioceses, uh, I would argue, are Potemkin villages uh, only for the purposes of propping up litigation. Uh, as your viewers already know, um, the uh, Fort Worth case has been taken up by the Texas Supreme Court mm -hmm. and will be uh, heard uh, later. Um, the membership in these dioceses has collapsed catastrophically. Um, it's down uh, 17 points and 19 points uh, respectively for, for these two dioceses. And um, their attendance is, is different than that. Uh, Fort Worth actually uh, reported a gain of 11 people in attendance, so technically they're in the black. Uh, but I think what this shows is that um, their membership numbers were pretty... Uh, Buffered? They, they, yeah, they, they were... Uh, I mean, G George has talked about this before, where, where he's pointed out that Episcopal membership numbers are, are, are somewhere between highly aspirational and completely fabricated. Um, they're... Uh, they Except at so George's <laughs> church, we find out. <laughs> well, yeah, but 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 I, when George's church, I was talking about attendance numbers. Um, so um, that there is, uh, I had that caveat that uh, membership is something you always take with a brick of salt yes, when you're you talking about the Episcopal <laughs> Church. Uh, attendance is probably the better guide to look at. Yeah. Um, but um, there is uh, just a, uh, a significant absence, though, in, in a variety of different uh, congregations. Uh, excuse me, uh, different dioceses across the Episcopal Church, um, where you're getting groups reporting, uh, in some cases, uh, around 10%. Now, obviously, that the 17% and 19% declines, and the 20% one in uh, New Hampshire are really bad. But I'm talking about normal dioceses that haven't had cataclysmic or especially controversial things happen to them, uh, which are experiencing pretty large levels of decline. 
And um, part of what uh, would be helpful to look at would be to say, uh, what are these, these churches experiencing? And is there a way that this can be addressed in the future? And uh, what we see from the numbers is that um, there are, are two things I want to mention. One is the, the age of the average Episcopalian is increasing. The size of the average Episcopal Church's congregation is decreasing. And we're seeing decreases in baptism rates and marriage rates. So um, this is something that is especially important for those latter two statistics because baptism and marriage rates often foreshadow what membership and attendance numbers are going to look like uh, within 10 to 20 years. Well, let's look at it this way. I'm probably 10, maybe 13 years older than you. Uh, mm-hmm. I got married in 1989, right out of college. Uh, mm-hmm. We started a family, had kids. I had a house by the time I was 25. And mm-hmm. so I was part of that uh, 80s nuclear family architecture. You mm-hmm. go out not but you know, towards your age and people just stop getting married right away. There, there, there's this weight. What's, what, tell me a little bit about that. Well, there is data that we have which shows that the average age at which someone in the United States gets married has increased both for women and for men. And, and for men, it's pushing up around 30 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, frankly, I'm... Uh, you know, an example of this even more than most. I live in Washington, D.C. It's an expensive uh, real estate market. I don't own my own home. Uh, I turned 40 in March and I'm not married yet. Uh, so these are things that mean I, I don't have children, uh, which obviously, if they don't exist, I'm not bringing them to church with me. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is something that, that has happened over a, a broad spectrum of time. Um, I, I would say that there's different competing ideas among cultural conservatives and cultural liberals at who forms families. Um, Cultural liberals believe that uh, adults form families. Cultural conservatives believe that families form adults. Mm -hmm. And um, that what that sort of means is that in a liberal context, you check all your boxes of education, career, understanding, quote unquote, who you are. And then once all that is sorted out, then you you get married more of as a celebration of uh, what you've already done uh, than what you're going to be doing in the future. Uh, cultural conservatives, on the other hand, believe it's usually good for people to get married when they're young. You take two crazy kids who don't know hella beans about the world, but they will grow together and will come into adulthood as part of this process of, of marriage and family. Um, so there's a real difference across our culture right now about how that's understood. And I think there are important elements of truth in both of those positions. Well, um, there, there has to be, because if you look at the younger mix, the people who get together and get married in their 18, 19, 20, any time between 28, have a higher divorce rate. That The statistics are there. You know, anybody getting married before the 30 has a higher divorce rate than those getting married after the 30. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, we can also see, looking at the success rates of marriages, that, that they are different. Um, it is incorrect, but is often circulated that half of all uh, that, 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 that that half of all marriages end in divorce. Uh, that's not completely accurate. Oh no, not, um, not in they're, the they're, evangelical context. When well, you take actually, it, I'm talking about the United States as a whole sure, across okay. the entire culture. Um, what happens is. Yes, it is true that half of all marriages end in divorce, but that is not half of all first marriages. Uh, It's less than 40% of first marriages that end in divorce. What happens is people who go on to second marriages and third marriages, they're more likely to divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas if if you get married for the first time, uh, there is um, just over a 60% chance that your marriage will not end in divorce. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about my crazy uncle, but I think the record in the Coulson family is now four marriages. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, even the point is that these things are in the culture and they, they have an effect on all of us. Uh, my parents were married in 1973. Uh, they've had a long and successful marriage and uh, they clearly did not end in divorce. Um, yet, every single one of my aunts and uncles has been divorced. Um, some of them have happily gone on to remarry and have had good um, second marriages. Um, but um, the point is that 
that still hangs over me and it hangs over my generation. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of divorce in the 1970s and 80s and Generation X people, of which I'm at the tail end of, are uh, very, very mindful of the likelihood of divorce and very concerned about it. Um, so that is one thing that, 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 that shapes ultimately uh, population replacement and procreation. Yeah. All right, we just gave in all our viewers 35 minutes of stats. I'm sorry, <laughs> but it had to be done. You need to know the truth. The truth is out there. The truth will set you free. Um, it's interesting that they're publishing less and less detail, detail, detail of the numbers for the Episcopal Church. But, you know, the writings of the wall for a lot of denominations, a lot of reformed uh, uh, synagogues, as we talked about. Um, and it's time for a reformation. It's time for uh, something new to occur. And you and I are involved with something new with the ACNA, and we, we pray that the, the church finds its way and that there is uh, a repentance and a rebirth of it. It's hard to do these numbers, but you guys need the truth. You need to know that um, uh, things are, are slanting down. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Jeff Walton, and, and it's been, uh, September 11th, 2019. Yeah, and you've been watching episode 532.